and welcome. I'm Sarah Shelton, market editor at Lux Interiors and Design. Here at Lux, we are celebrating Black History Month in a big way, and we're recognizing and showcasing the work of Black artisans and makers that are inspiring us, and then I'm sure will inspire you as well. Today, we are chatting with creative chameleon, Basil Kincaid, who gets all the credit for the mesmerizing quilted masterpiece we featured within the January-February issue of Lux, which is on newsstands now. Not only is he wildly talented, but his positive energy is quite contagious. Hi, Basil, and welcome. Hey, thanks for having me, Sarah. It's great to connect with you. Yeah, no, thank you so much for jumping on today. You know, before we dive into some of this incredible work that you're doing that we can see behind you, um, I just wanted you to give us a chance to tell the, the viewers, like, your background. What do you do? Where are you based? What, are, what do you make? Yeah, so um, I'm Basil Kincaid from St. Louis, Missouri, um, born and raised there. I'm currently in Ghana, so I have a um, studio here. I work between here and St. Louis, and what do I do is a great question. Um, I do a number of things. I guess as far as art, I started drawing. Um, that was my first love. Then I got into painting in college. Let's see, five years ago, I came to Ghana for the first time and I was doing large scale collage works. But that time period influenced me to dig into my family history. And that's what got me interested in quilting. So when I came back in 2016, I started just doing a lot more familial research. And I always remembered my grandmother making quilts, but I didn't realize that it was just a multi-generational tradition that, you know, until my generation was unbroken. So I'm carrying on the family art and doing it in my own way. These are all things that I can't wait to dive into. I know you said that you, you know, had a residency there years ago and you're back now. Um, so clearly the, the, the country is a big influence for you. How has that residency impacted your work? You said that it was there that you... So this residency um, is through a Boston-based organization called Arts Connect International. And I mean, honestly, I feel like they're the springboard for my career. So it's a year long residency. And the first three months are an entrepreneurial component where you're learning about how to operate yourself as a business and how to, you know, build your brand as an entrepreneur and tangible ways to use your art to support yourself. So that was a really fundamental experience for me and then it had a nine month abroad component before i came i applied with a body of work that i made with things that i found on the street in st louis and i wanted to continue that work here using material that i found that had some every some significance to everyday life that time period i was using prepaid phone cards you don't really see them as much anymore so i'll collect those and then make large scale collages with those and some sculptures too but that time period, um, I made some really valuable relationships that, you know, I maintain till now. And that made it possible um, for me to set up this studio and return to continue my quilting work. And so now here, I'm fusing, um, you know, my own art styles, like this work behind me is um, inspired by a drawing that I made. And so I'm trying to like unite my drawing collage and quilting techniques into this new body of work. So clearly the, the country has been a in, big influence for you and you're, you, you're back there and we can only imagine what's going to come out of this, you know, this visit this year. Um, but I would love to talk about your, your family and particularly the, the women in your family who inspired you to look into traditions from the past. Can yeah. you talk about that connection between your family and their crafts and the, and the art that you're creating in the present day? Absolutely. So um, I didn't really realize how deep it got. You know, I, at first, my entry point was just my grandmother, my dad's mom, Eugenia. Um, and they're, you know, they were farming folks. My grandparents owned a farm. And so every summer I would go down and spend time on the family farm. And I just noticed how, like, you know, my grandmother might be working on something by herself in the house, but the group of women would get together and be quilting together. And it was a communal, you know, community-based practice. So like they may, you know, work on their individual quilts, you know, by themselves. And then when it came time to do the finishing, you know, where they 
the actual quilting is when you combine all three layers, they would do that communally. They'd help each other so that, that would go faster. The more I, more questions I asked, the more I learned. And I came to find out that my grandmother and some of her sisters, they actually built like, um, maybe factory is the right word. So they were making these quilts that um, became recognized as like emblematic of basically Arkansas style. And so they got a, you know, for several years, they got these government contracts to make, you know, historical quilts that were representative of Arkansas, similar to what you see here, this kind of improvisational quilt making. But a lot of those women were innovators, you know, they were making up their own styles. Um, so yeah, my Aunt Vera, or well, my great Aunt Vera, I think she was the leader of this quilt collective. And then, you know, I just got deeper into asking questions and realized that, you know, there's been an unbroken link for, you know, at least seven generations. So that's hundreds of years going back where, um, you know, these women are teaching each other and passing down the tradition from mother to daughter and from, you know, from sister to sister, you know, down through um, until we, you know, until we get to the present day. And so I just feel honored to be able to continue that, you know. Um, and it was something that, like, it made me feel a lot more belonging in the sense of, like, creating within um, a canon that I feel ownership in. You know, like, studying art in school, I always kind of felt like an outsider. Um, so much of the curriculum was based on, you know, basically what white, old white men, what they had made and what was important to them. I didn't really see myself reflected in that space. And so it gave me a lot of encouragement to position myself within something that's intrinsic to me and my family. And then now to be able to, you know, take it to the world stage is a pleasure of mine. And I'm just, I'm thankful that I get to, you know, carry the torch. Well, I'm sure that those generations of women, um, you know, who came before you would be so proud to see that you're carrying it on and through this, you know, modern lens, which, but, but still recognizes the, the artistry and the technique that, that you learned that was passed down. Um, you, it, I, I, it struck me that you said, you know, you mentioned um, like belonging and, um, you know, when you were creating with, with your family or learning those skills from your family, which, you know, brings me to a point that I really wanted to talk about when, um, when we spoke earlier, um, a couple months ago, when we first started working on this magazine page, you talked about um, identity and how creating is a way for you to search for self-understanding. Um, can you expand on that uh, uh, for us a bit? Um, you know, understanding your your heritage and also understanding like, you know, you, you as a Black man in, in today's culture. Yeah, um, you know, so much gets projected onto us that for me the art is a place where i can kind of peel the layers off and then have time with my true self you know and i feel like a lot of these you know different things are applied to us and they're they're applied with a set of meanings that we don't always self-defined. And so for me, the big process has been, I guess, self-definition, like, you know, looking at what is projected and taking the agency to say, what will I keep and what will I discard? Um, and a lot of, you know, a lot of the societal projection I'm choosing to discard. Yeah, I guess you get to think about what's meaningful for yourself versus like, you know, society can say all these things about what it means to be black or what it means to be a man or what it means to be any any one of these you know categorized identities and most of the time that stuff is like you know useful for selling uh, selling things to us not necessarily so useful in terms of understanding your true self and so you know it's a really personal and specific process, I guess. I don't, I don't have answers for a generalized, like what it means to be black. I can't ever say that because we're not, you know, a monolith. Um, 
But for me, I'm thankful to have the time to make my art because that is a meditative time where I get to be with myself and I get to strip away all those layers and I get to see what's left, see what remains. And a lot of the times, like, what remains is joy, you know, all of this, you know, all these terrible things have been, I mean, all of the world's greatest atrocities have been enacted on black people throughout time. And it will be reasonable to believe that, you know, those things have the power to shape an individual. But what I'm finding is that, you know, everybody, whatever background they come from or whatever experience they come from, what I'm finding for myself and, you know, what the art is helping me understand is that, you know, there's some stuff in you that nobody can take away. There's things that nobody can touch, no matter their greatest effort. So um, I'm just thankful for that, to know that there's like parts of our being that no matter the projection, it stays true, you know? Mm -hmm. And I guess everybody has to find those things for themselves. And it, it may not be art, you know, for some people it may be it may be any number of different pursuits. It doesn't necessarily have to be art, but when you get a chance to be totally present with something, it'll reveal things about you that you didn't know about yourself. So uh, I hope that answers your question. Beyond, uh, thank you so much. Sorry, I got a little, emo I get a little emotional. No, it, the, we appreciate your vulnerability and just sharing, um, you know, you know, at, when we look at your work, we see beautiful work, but it's clear that there is so much more, you know, behind those quilts or behind those paintings, like, you know, what the cathartic feelings that you have when you're creating and what goes into these works. It's, uh, it's really eye opening for us as, you know, visual consumers, you know, to learn, you know, what goes into, you know, work like this and what's going through your mind. Well, speaking of, you know, the creative process, Basil, I would love to know, cause I, you know, I follow you on Instagram and I think all of you should go follow him <laughs> if you haven't already, but it looks like you have a lot of fun in the studio. And I would just I do love to know what it, what it's like when you're creating, you know, what is it like to be in the studio with you? Yeah. So, I mean, I guess it's different on different days, but, um, you know, there's a mixture of, <laughs> there's a mixture of all sorts of different stuff. Cause like, you know, sometimes it's super focused on like one particular task. And so it may be like, you know, from the outside kind of boring cause I might just be hand sewing or I might just be behind the machine. But um, I guess a typical day, like I'll come, I like to warm up, you know, I like to get limber. So I'll like maybe dance around or do some mobilizing just to get my, you know, joints loosened up and get my body ready. Cause it's like, I like to work on the floor, even if it's a day where I'm behind the machine for six hours, just, you know, making like this, you know, patchwork. I enjoy doing it. It's like that old saying, like, do what you love and you never work a day in your life. Well, it sounds like <laughs> you. Yeah, I think that's half out. true. I mean, it's definitely work. It's definitely work, but at least I get to enjoy doing it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, it sounds like you're doing, you're in the right field for sure. Yeah. Um, Basil, I just wanted to end and ask you, um, you know, what's next? Where do you, what are you working on? What is, you know, what's yeah. on the horizon? And we would love to know. Yeah, the horizon is, is exciting. And I think part of why I'm so emotional today is because they just made the announcement. So I'm one of this year's um, United States Artist Fellows. It's like a my first national award. Wow, um, congratulations. That's thank incredible. You. Thanks. Oh, wow. And then um, I got a lot of news. I mean, I'll give y'all a little bit. So I just, um, on the 29th, so just a few days ago, I opened um, a solo show in the Canary Islands at a gallery called uh, Gallery of Landecker. And that's my first time. Um, it's my first solo show of my collage work. So I'm really excited about that. And I will be showing this work, this body of work soon. I can't like announce where yet, but there's a show in the pipeline for this work that I'm working on now, the new quilt work. And I'm really excited to share that. So. Um, there's, there's show, I guess I can mention, I have a, this is like towards the end of the year, I have a show in Sweden with a gallery called Carl Castiel, 
Um, so I'm excited. I mean, there's like more international opportunities coming. And so, you know, my uh, prayers are up for when I get my first museum show. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm, that's what I'm manifesting for the horizon. <laughs> right, well, we are right there with you manifesting that, but it sounds like you right now have your hands full with some really incredible opportunities. Uh, we cannot wait to follow along to see what's next. And we wish you all the best. And um, we're so appreciative and grateful that we could connect and, and learn more about what you do and the incredible art that you make. Thank you so much, Sarah. This has been a lot of fun. And I mean, we could talk all day. I'm not going to take all your time, but I appreciate getting to connect. And I hope that this is just the beginning. So absolutely. Let's do this again for sure. <laughs>
What's sort of interesting to me about both the caviar sconces and the mirrors is that they're very hard to photograph convincingly and means they're successful to me because we've created an experience that you need to be present for. You know, there's no running out of inspiration. We're not pulling ideas out of our head. We're seeing what's happening in front of us and responding to it.